It's the last day of March. Opening day is tomorrow. A little over a year ago, the VIX index roared to a new all-time closing high up at 82.69, exceeding any closing level during 2008 and 2009. And even though the S&P 500 experienced its fastest 30% drop in history at just 22 trading days, it's good to note that the stock market has recovered from every previous bear market. Today, I trot out Joe Tige, Portfolio Manager of Equity Armor Investments, and SIBO's Senior Options Institute instructor, Kevin Davitt, to discuss the volatility market landscape, what the VIX can tell us, how to protect your portfolio, and we try to squeeze in as many as baseball puns as we can. Let's take a listen. Joe, welcome on. First time caller. How are you? Thank you very much for having me. It's very good to be here. And basically my co-host at this point, Kevin Davitt. How are you, man? Good to see you. Last time we talked was, I think, September 9th. I'm doing wonderful, and it's great to be back. I look forward to it. Great, great. Let's jump right into it. You know, it's I know it's a tough act to summarize an entire year, uh, in a few short, short sentences, Kevin, is it safe to say that global markets have regained their footing from the past 12 months? That is uh, a tough act, but I think it was Shakespeare and Hamlet where they point out that brevity is the soul of wit, so let's try to get witty. Um, the S&P 500, uh, looking back, experienced a technical bear market between February 19th and March 23rd of last year. Now, as many people know, it was the sharpest 30% decline in history, and it was followed by the fastest bull market in history. So we had a whiplash market. And it might sound fairly obvious to point out that markets, to use your words, have regained their footing when the S&P 500 is up 77% from the March lows of last year. That's the largest 12-month advance for the index since it was introduced in 1957. And you'd have to go back to the mid-1930s for a larger move on a rolling one-year time frame. So the Bellwether U.S. Equity Index is 17% higher than the Feb 2020 highs. So on face and in price terms, the market is on solid footing. I would argue that there's potentially microstructure elements under the market that might indicate future issues, which I imagine we'll get into. What do you have to say about it, Joe? Yeah, I would say that's uh, spot on. It's been um, a year we won't forget, to say the least. Uh, and to say that uh, the market has recovered is an understatement. Uh, I think I think I'm concerned about some of the under underpinning uh, aspects of of the market, but um, just where we're sitting today, um, certainly the the markets are at ease with uh, with the pandemic situation. Okay. And what is the moment, Kev, you can take this, or what is the defining moment that characterizes a new market cycle in the first place so investors can start to pinpoint rather in looking forward or looking back? Yeah, we love to, to pinpoint dates, right? I think that's a natural inclination. Mm -hmm. There's probably a couple of ways that you could answer it from a technical perspective. The kind of 2009 to 2020 bull market run ended in March of last year. Now, from a purist standpoint, if you get a 20% move lower in the broad market on, on a closing basis, textbooks will refer to it as a bear market. Yes. But as I alluded to a minute ago, this bear market was unlike any other. The last two technical bear markets ended in March of 2009 and October of 2002. Those took 517 days and 929 calendar days to play out. The 2020 version took 33 calendar days. So back to your point, if your primary concern or risk is price, then a new bull market began on March 23rd of last year, and it's just over a year old. Joe and I are both kind of focused on derivative markets and volatility, which is a cr critical component 
with respect to things like futures and options, those tools. And I imagine we'll get to those or to viewing the market through that lens shortly. But from a letter of the law standpoint, bull and bear markets are defined by 20% closing moves higher or lower. Wonderful. Wonderful. Joe, what do you got? When it comes to uh, just that that stretch, uh, we have, we have I obviously focus on the VIX a lot, um, and the VIX sometimes is a leading indicator or an indicator. Uh, and I notice when the market bottoms and the VIX peaks at the same time, uh, that can be a change in sentiment. Of course, that happened in March. Of course, that happened a lot faster uh, than uh, historically it's happened. But when we saw the market recovering and the VIX making a lower low and the market making a new relative high, uh, you know, and I'm talking about the VIX coming down into the 50s and the market uh, coming off of that 35% drop up, you know, down to only 25%, uh, that we could have said was, okay, now we're in a new era. Um, but again, that's only, it was only known in hindsight. We didn't know it when it was actually peaking. So. Yes. Um, so that's just kind of the uncertainty of it and uh, what happens with volatility. Okay. Yeah, but when, when you point out, I think that's an interesting point you bring up, the VIX uh, index on a closing basis peaked last year on the 16th of March, and technically the S&P didn't find a bottom until about a week later. So you could argue that leading indicator mm -hmm. worked last year. There isn't any silver bullet. But if you have that on your screen and on your radar, that can be valuable the next time something unforeseen occurs. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Um, well, let's go straight into volatility since I know both of you are chomping at the bit here. Um, it, it, the volatility markets seem to be revealing a higher volatility regime now. To start, what does that mean and why is it important to distinguish? Joe, you can go first and then Kevin can finish yeah so uh it's all relative we need to remember last year we had the vix peaking out in the 80s uh, slowly uh, went came back down uh and now we're kind of settling in where the low side of the range is you know maybe the high teens um to the low 20s is kind of where the vix is is bouncing around lately mm -hmm. and um in the past year that's low but if you go back in the last bull market that's kind of high uh, when and, you know, as we sit here today, as we're recording this, the S and P 500 is just a few points away from an all-time high, and we still have the VIX in the high teens. Uh, so this is signaling to me that there's a new normal for the VIX. The new normal is we're going to be having a relatively higher volatility, and uh, the reasons for that for me are that um, you know the economy and the stock market are not quite on the same page. A lot of the economic um, buildup has been stimulative, uh, money handed out by the government. Uh, that continues to be the case. Uh, we have a, term, a stimulus package coming out soon. Uh, and the market, of course, loves that, which sets up this uh, weird dichotomy where we have high price to earning ratios. And the market's pricing that in because they're expecting the economy to be stimulated by the money going in. And the economy has yet to catch up. So that creates a, a margin of error for these companies. Um, which are, is really narrow, they have to hit their earnings. And then the second thing, which is very uh, volatile, is the low interest rates. And I know they're rising uh, as we speak, but they're still historically very low. Uh, and when we have low interest rates, that, that leads to higher volatility because when we have a small interest rate percentage move, a interest rate point move, it's a larger percentage move when it's lower, and the moves tend to be the same, it's just higher percentage. So that creates more volatility in the, in, throughout the whole equity market. So I take absolute, I, I would echo Joe's points on kind of the, the market here and now. To your question about sort of what does higher volatility mean or, or how, how might you distinguish that, I'd take maybe a little bit broader perspective and point out that as Joe did, realized and implied volatility levels remain higher than pre-pandemic on both a short and longer term basis. Now, for those that are maybe unfamiliar, realized volatility is based on historical data. So to what extent were underlying prices moving over a specific time frame in the past? Implied volatility measures are forward-looking, 
and there we're talking about something like the VIX index. So the value is backed out based on an option pricing model. But in short, it's a, a dynamic estimate of potential future volatility. And Joe mentioned that bellwether measure for equity volatility being the VIX index. And, and I would contend that higher volatility markets can provide both opportunities as well as risks. And that might be obvious, but thinking about it that way helps me. The timing and flexibility elements embedded in options have become really widely embraced. I say this often, but volatility is a constant. And it's, it's one of those words where the connotation and the denotation of the word volatility are often distinct and that volatility is neither inherently good nor bad. Those, those measures ebb and flow. But as Joe pointed out, the uncertainty, as we look forward, there's considerable unknowns and there's tremendous information embedded in things like the VIX and, and then just rounding it out, like forecasts are imperfect, but they're super useful mm -hmm. and options can give us great insights into what the market is collectively forecasting with respect to future uncertainty, right? So, um, I mean, if, if you want to make it a little more tangible, if the forecast calls for wind and rain and falling temperatures, we're talking about opening day for baseball tomorrow, right? And it's 65 and sunny. Now that might impact your planning and choices about clothing in the future. And, and that, that information alone can be super valuable. Yeah. I, I hate to run with that analogy, but I think that's why you always layer up <laughs> You know, we, you always wear a long sleeve shirt, maybe, you know, something to protect you either way, give you the flexibility. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I, I ran too far with that, but, uh, Joe, I want to talk about, I, your, I want to talk to you about your expertise here a little bit. How does, um, how does all of this impact a client's risk management decision? Yeah. So we're sitting in the area, we're expecting more volatility. Uh, so uh, we have a few choices for protection to the downside. Of course, uh, the traditional method uh, advisors usually look at is a uh, balanced blended portfolio. You, know, you have equities and you have bonds. Historically, that's provided protection to the downside. You have bonds, uh, which give you a cushion when the equities go lower, your bond portfolio does well. Lately, that's not been um, providing uh, any downside protection. It's actually adding risk. We're seeing uh, equity risk uh, to bonds, to rates specifically. So uh, looking at volatility is a really uh, attractive space for me to, in order to, to provide downside equity protection. Now, uh, it's also kind of matured, but the volatility space has matured to a point where it's a lot easier to do that for uh, the average investor. Um, there are VIX futures now. Uh, people can invest in VIX mm -hmm. futures uh, mm -hmm. or they can invest in funds which do that for them like my own um and but before there were VIX futures it was a lot harder to get involved in in pure volatility uh you could buy puts in the s p 500 in index options uh that would be fundamentally different than a VIX future though because uh first of all those of course expire regularly uh, but uh when you're buying volatility in for instance the s p 500 what you're in, in it, what you're effectively doing is buying the difference between the implied vol and what the actual realized vol will be. Okay, so you're making a bet that the realized vol will be more than the implied vol you purchased. Uh, when you're owning VIX futures, uh, you can you're actually just saying, okay, I expect this future to go higher because uh, you're just buying something that has a set price rather than depending on the actual volatility of any index. So it's more of a pure volatility play, and that of course has only been around since 2006. Uh, Back before 2006, uh, if you remember all the way back then, we were uh, on uh, Blackberries instead of Apples. Or <laughs> Actually, I had a flip phone. I remember very well an ESPN uh, flip phone. It did the da 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 da, -da. <laughs> And I was the biggest nerd, but I loved it. Um, uh, anyways, uh, uh, the, the VIX futures allow us a pure play in uh, volatility, which uh, moves very highly negatively correlated against the market. And it allows advisors like myself to be aggressive when the market's lower. Kevin talked about volatility being a uh, potential benefit. Uh, 
that I have two portions of my portfolio. I have an equity portion, a volatility portion. When the market's lower, I can harvest the returns on my volatility portion, put it back into my equities, which are now lower, which uh, uh, getting inside baseball in the options world, that's trading long gamma, which allows me to buy low and sell high in the market. Very interesting. Um, Very interesting. I love that. Um, yeah, I, my dad promised me he was going to get me the ESPN phone if I got straight A's. And, uh, yeah, I haven't seen the phone. So, it wasn't worth it. <laughs> um, I do want to, um, or, or Kevin, did you have anything you wanted to add or? No, I'm just a big fan of the analogies and, uh, Joe's pointing out that correlation risk where it has been fairly strongly positive between fixed income markets and equity markets of late and historically a demonstrably negative correlation between volatility as measured by VIX or VIX futures and the equity market. So I think that's that's a key thing to be be mindful of. Okay. Uh, so I, I want to talk a little bit about VIX hedges and their applications making sense in, in a higher vol regime. Uh, Joe, is it easier to time compared to index puts? And, and then Kev, you can, you can follow up and fill in the blanks. Um, well, uh, it's, it's more purely a negative correlated uh, asset. Of course, um, you, like I said, you don't have to worry about the implied versus realized volatility. Uh, there still is the same challenges of rolling uh, and I think it takes, in either case, it takes an expert with some hands-on knowledge of the, um, the instrument. Uh, of course, you have VIX futures, which move independently of the actual index. So it takes some knowledge of the seasonality of it, the timing of it. Uh, but uh, to be able to do a daily rebalance, is, which is what I do, which is very tricky to do with an option position, uh, you get a very wide bid-ask spread. Uh, to get it on and off is not as simple. With the VIX futures, they're very liquid, very deep. Uh, it allows uh, for a clean um, daily rebalance uh, in the VIX futures world. Okay. Kevin, anything to add? So I, I'd be careful, and I think Joe did a great job of pointing out that none of this is easy, right? Mm-hmm. And so really understanding the tools and their utility and perhaps your own limitations is important here. And then as I'm inclined to often do, I, I sort of take a step back and think about it from a broader perspective. And I would argue that hedges make sense, period, kind of independent of the, the overall regime. I think the, the regime might inform your sizing and potentially the monetization of those hedges, okay. which Joe hinted at already, and I'm, I might elaborate on. So from a big picture standpoint, hedges are designed to lose money. That's reality, but it's one that many market participants and particularly new ones are kind of loath to admit. Mm-hmm. And I understand it. We want to grow our account balances. And then there's this desire to want to time the market and I'll be vulnerable. I have been in the markets for the better part of the past 20 years and I've never top tick uh, sold the market or bought the bottom, right? Not ever. So if you have considerable money and that can vary depending on your situation in life in the market, a shock like a, a pandemic or a financial crisis from 12 years ago or 20 years ago, if you're a little bit older like Joe and me, um, can, can really, really impact your bottom line. And so protection in the event of a big move can, it's a little cliche, but keep you in the game. And something Joe hinted at that I would absolutely reinforce, that protection can enable you to allocate capital back into equity markets when they're discounted as opposed to being reactionary, which is a much more typical behavior when kind of the proverbial house is on fire. So again, uh, understanding that full cost benefit analysis. And if we went back to that weather forecast ahead of baseball, like if you know that inclement weather is a distinct possibility, you plan ahead like if you go to Ireland or Scotland without uh, a, a rain jacket, that's your fault, right? 
So I think Hedges just makes sense, period. Or to the Reds opening day, um, you, you better you better dress up. The, the, the analogies are flying fast and furious today. Uh, and I, I really do like what Joe said about the uh, the reallocating. That that articulated a lot for me. Yeah, uh, uh, maybe, maybe if I can play cleanup hitter on that. Go um, ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the bases are loaded here. Um, we, we're we talking about how this, uh, this hedge is considered to be an insurance, and most people are accepting that insurance will cost money. Um, and, and again, um, going back to the implied versus realized trade here, if the implied, or if you buy something implied and it realizes more than the implied, it actually will be profitable. And the way that options are priced is that there's a potential for a move every single day. So if you have a passive trade, you're more likely to have a big drag and having an insurance cost you money. If you have a passive hedge, if you have an active hedge where you're trading daily, uh, your chances for profit and making that uh, insurance cost money, cost less money, or even be profitable are much greater. So that's that's why I think uh, it's very important to consider this uh, active trade uh, where we're expecting, we're not expecting the VIX to make money over time because uh, we can hold it uh, just like equities. We do expect equities to make money over time, but we expect the VIX to go higher and come back down lower and then revert to the mean. Uh, that's why you need to be active on it. You need to be adding when it drops. You need to be selling it when it when it goes up. Very, very sound advice. I want to kind of take a page out of Kevin's book here and, and, and take a step back. Um, as of right now, I, I just had it pulled up. Let me see here. VIX is sitting at 19.21. So that's a pretty low level right now. Uh, so wouldn't that indicate a sense or return to quote unquote normal levels? I know, Joe, you talked about a new normal. Uh, would you want to you know explain that a little bit? Yeah, so the VIX has been trending lower for some time. Uh, it took a while to crack that 20 mark. There's nothing magical about it, but it seemed, okay. seemed stubborn to want to fall below there. Uh, and we're still trending lower now, but as we are uh, low, we still are having these mini blips back above 20, 22, 23. Uh, so and I expect more of that to happen uh, because there's still more shaking out of the economy that needs to happen. Uh, we have, you know, the growth names, which are had a tremendous year uh, for the past 12 months. Uh, are st- we're still catching up to them in value. So while that shakes out, we're going to have a little bit of under- uncertainty there. And at the end of the day, um, we have more uncertainty than normal right now. And the essence of volatility is uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen. You know, a week ago, I, you know, I would not have predicted that a ship blocking the Suez Canal was going to cause like a big big impact in, um, you know, global trade. And I would not have predicted a pandemic, you know, 14 months ago either. So uh, there's just a lot of unknowns. And right now, given the state of the economy where uh, we expect it to be really good, it's not good yet. Um, that's just, that's just, we're sitting in a spot where it's, there's a lot of unknowns. Mm-hmm. Kevin? I, I echo most of what Joe had to say, I guess the the only or reinforce that it does seem like we're returning to some version of normal. In my opinion, that'll likely be characterized by a slightly higher baseline, which again is echoing what Joe had to say for volatility measures. We'll likely continue to see spats of what I characterize idiosyncratic volatility whether it's suez canal or whatever the next one happens to be Mm -hmm. just like you see in kind of any pre-2020 market we remember these huge huge moves but in the interim there's a whole bunch of of kind of noisy volatility moves and then sort of pointing out one the vix index is back around 19 as of today but the vix index is not tradable it's an index it measures and then the VIX futures, which Joe Joe spoke about already and, and manages those day to day, are on average or they remain high relative to kind of a more normal VIX around 19 market. So that's indicative of S&P 500 index options pricing in that potential for greater future swings up and down is worth pointing out that volatility is non-directional. 
Um, and so understanding that or having a better understanding of that entire ecosystem, I think can be very beneficial. Well said. Well said. Um, I think we're going, we're going to about to wrap up here. I want to close with one broader question about sentiment. Kevin, you can take this and then Joe can, can bring it home. But regarding the market sentiment, what what is really spooking investors and what can participants expect broadly from volatility for the rest of 2021? It's a great question. It's one that I think legitimately millions and millions of people are, mm-hmm. are asking themselves in the wake of the past year, the woulda, coulda, shouldas. So from my perspective, and again, this is just my opinion, it seems like Inflation and that relationship to interest rates in the U.S. and globally will continue to be a fairly paramount concern. I'd point out that there is a relationship where that that fixed income markets and that equity markets are kind of competing for a finite pool of capital. And so at what, per, at what point or is there an inflection point between interest rates, whether the 10 year moves through 2%, does that does that incentivize people to move more capital into bonds? I don't know the the answer to that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's one that concerns a number of investors, or maybe on a like on a really basic level, we've seen the prices for things like food and energy move markedly higher in the past couple of months. Now, from an inflation standpoint, those are stripped out of your your core CPI calculations that the Fed points to, but they impact your pocketbook, my pocketbook, Joe's pocketbook. At what point does that become a meaningful drag on potential spending, which is what drives the economy forward? Consumer spending, maybe well behind that would be moves in housing, like if that becomes... uh, uh, a stretch for too many people. And then the one last, I think, very legitimate one, which we've skirted around the issue would be valuation. So Joe pointed out that looking ahead, we're expecting a recovery. And part of that would be much stronger earnings in the next year. Otherwise, the broad market PE ratio would be unusually high. And if that has to meet somewhere in between, what what that might mean in terms of a drawdown, I think is is an interesting one. What about you, Joe? What do you think about my my worries? Yeah, I think that's pretty true. Uh, there, and the way that I always think about it also is that there's always a list of worries, though, just like you said, and they're mm-hmm. always pressing. They always feel really important. Uh, we're always really excited about the next jobs report. We're always really excited about the next uh, FOMC meeting. And um, at the end of the day, my view doesn't usually change. I think if you have a long-term view, I think the market will be higher to a five to 10 year horizon. But while the market's going higher, uh, I'm pretty confident periodically, almost once a year, there's going to be a big volatility event. So my view is I always want to be in the market and I always want to have a hedge. Now, uh, right now, going back to what's currently on my mind, is that, um, and this is just like a lot of other people I'm talking to, is that they're worried on that the the market might go up 30% this year and they'll be in cash. Uh, That's one worry. Um, They don't, that's that's just as bad as being down to some people. Uh, And then you also have to worry that we're, that there's really high PE ratios. There's all these things that we're always worried about and the market's about to crash. So um, both things are possible. And that's why for me, being invested in the market, with a hedge is my favorite way to invest and is why I can sleep easy. Very well yeah, said. You're talking about the proactive versus reactive if you're able to manage both of those things. Well put. Very well said. Very well said. Joe, Kevin, I, I hate to finish with one more analogy, but and it's the easy one, but you guys hit it out of the park. Uh, I can't thank you enough for coming on. And, uh, you know, Kevin, you're your returning guest, so thank you again. And Joe, hopefully you can come back. You put it on the team, Patrick. These are these are seventy mile an hour fastballs. Even some guy on the Reds could hit that out of the park. Yeah, there we go. We can log off right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cheers, guys.